My grandmother gave me a chisel for my 17th birthday. A chisel. Welcome to the world of histrionics. Incredible adventures from before the now. My name is Howard Carter, and I am the Egyptologist who uncovered and discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun, the boy king of ancient Egypt. My father was a painter, and I was sick. A lot when I was a child. I used to spend a great deal of time in our bed at home, looking out of the window, drawing and painting birds, trying no doubt to impress my father. But I didn't get any better, and so he and my mother decided that I should move to Norfolk to take in the country air. And it was whilst there, and feeling much better, thank you very much, that I saw my first set of ancient Egyptian artefacts and became hooked. I was visiting Didlington Hall, an old stately home, and I saw them. Items that had actually been buried for hundreds, thousands of years beneath the Egyptian sands. Well, I was so excited, I started to draw them and sketch them immediately. And the lady who owned the house, and Mary Cecil, was so impressed that she arranged for me to go to Egypt and join in with the excavations. I was only 17. My grandmother gave me the chisel because she thought I was going digging, and I wasn't. I was going to be drawing and painting the artifacts that would be taken out of the tombs. I worked over there for a very long time indeed, around about eight years, I think it was, and then I was made the chief inspector of the Egyptian Archaeology Service a position which I resigned from in 1905, thanks to some Frenchmen who were being incredibly disrespectful of one of the burial sites. They were trying to get in and visit it, like it was some kind of country park. I said, gentlemen, this is history you are walking all over. It is not a vacation for you here. Needless to say, these Frenchmen were very well connected and very wealthy, so I had no choice but to quit my job. After a difficult couple of years, I eventually encountered a man called Lord Carnarvon, who shared my enthusiasm for antiquity and appreciated the past as I did, as an important, respectful pursuit, and not some awful theatre show. We started digging in Thebes in 1907, and in 1914, eventually got permission to dig in the Valley of the Kings itself. There had been a rumour on many other grave sites that had been discovered that the boy king Tutankhamun was buried here. So we began to look. 1914 was going to be our year. And then the Great War began. All the digging stopped. All the money ceased. And I went to work on code breaking, passing messages. But four years later, when the war was over, we were back, ready to find the tomb of Tutankhamun. We searched for one year and found nothing. In the second year, we found nothing. In the third and the fourth years, we still found nothing. And for eight years, nothing. After eight years, Lord Carnarvon came to me and said, Right, Howard. I'm sorry about this, but um, I can't afford any more to keep coming out here with the sand and the flies and the heat and giving all of my money away for nothing. I'm sorry. If you don't find anything this year, then we're finished. Done. That's it. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Back home. Can you imagine? Eight years. Eight years. Nothing, and then that's it. 1922 is going to be our last year. We started overworking. We started taking less breaks and taking less sleep. We started looking at places we'd already examined, literally going over old ground. And it was on one of those days we had not slept nor rested enough that a mistake actually turned out to be rather lucky. You see, one of the uh, Egyptian lads, whose job it was to bring us the water for drinking, tripped. Now, I was angry. I was thirsty. And he'd spilt the water, but then I saw what he had tripped on. It was a flagstone. A flagstone where no flagstone should be, just behind some old huts. So we cleared the area around the flagstone and saw that it wasn't a flagstone at all. It was a step. And we cleared some more sand and dirt and dust and found out that it wasn't a step, but a flight of stairs that led down to a wall that was covered in hieroglyphs and cartouches, writing only used when the very, very important 
possibly kings, are buried. We sent a letter and a telegram right away to Lord Carnarvon. He arrived two and a half weeks later. And then in late November 1922, I walked down those steps right up to that wall and began to break through, or at least that's what I was going to do, but I forgot my tools. I left them at the top of the steps. Lord Carnarvon was too excited for me to go back. And then I reached into my old pack and found my grandmother's chisel that I carried with me for almost 30 years. I took it out and broke the top left section of the tomb. The wall came away fairly easily. And as I started to look through, I could sense Lord Carnarvon becoming more and more excited. Eventually, he started to jump up and down like a schoolchild and said, oh, please, Howard, tell me, tell me, could you see anything? And I said, yes, yes, I can. Wondrous things. It took us four months to clear out the anteroom that we had discovered. And when the last of the sentinel statues had been removed on the 16th of February, 1923, we entered Tutankhamun's burial chamber. It was incredible. The most complete tomb ever discovered. Objects, so many objects. There were bows and armour and jars and scarabs, very much like, like, like this one that I have here, scattered all over, stored all over the entire tomb. The sarcophagus itself, you'll have seen the images, the golden death mask, bright and dark, blue, shining. And the sarcophagus with writing all around the outside, the mummified body of the boy king. He must only have been a, in his late teens when he died. It was wrapped in several layers of bandages, and as we removed each one, we found amulets, we found scarabs, we found armour, all placed there to guard the body. But the oil that had been used to soak the bandages had been too thick, and the bandages had stuck to the body, essentially ruining the process of mummification. You see, the ancient Egyptians believed that their spirits once gone to the afterlife, can come back through the body and visit the world again. Many old Egyptian tombs still contain items like food and offerings, sometimes even toilets. And on one particular occasion, I remember we discovered in Tutankhamun's tomb several changes of underwear. In case the spirit wanted to come back and felt like putting on a fresh set of clothes, I suppose. So in order to that happen, they mummify the bodies. What they do, of course, is to take out all of the internal organs, the stomach, the lungs and the liver and the brains. They take a hook or a small tube and ram it up the nose and then allow the brain to drain out like a, like an enormous but still hideous bogey. Then once all that has been removed, they repack everything with herbs and spices, take the body out to naturally occurring salt in the desert and leave it there for around about 70 days. The body becomes dry and then they wrap it in the bandages. Then the body can be buried and then the soul can eventually come out. Now, when it does, the Egyptians, quite nicely, are a bit worried the soul might forget what it did in life. So all the writing around the tomb and sometimes on the sarcophagus themselves are supposed to remind the spirit of who it is and what it did. Then that spirit ascends, but not straight away to the field of reeds, which is the Egyptian paradise, very much like this earth. But there's no sickness and no injury and no death. No, it must ascend first to judgment. The god of death, the guardian of death, I suppose, the um, Anubis, the jackal-headed god, takes the spirit. And this particular journey is depicted on several pictures in tombs where you see a line of souls waiting to be judged. Incredible. You live a life, hardship possibly, or of luxury, but nonetheless not without its difficulty. And the first thing you have to do is join a queue of people waiting to see Osiris, the god of the underworld. You're about to get your judgment. What Osiris does is to weigh a feather, the feather of Ma'at, the goddess of harmony and morality. He takes the feather and he takes your heart, which is the only organ the Egyptians leave inside the bodies. The heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at. And if your heart is lighter than a feather, it means you've been a good person and therefore you can go to paradise. But if your heart is heavier than the feather, 
It means you've been bad. And your heart and your soul is immediately eaten by a god who has the head of a crocodile and the front parts of a leopard and then sometimes the back legs of a rhino but occasionally a hippo as well. A great horrible patchwork collage of different animals like a very badly evolved Pokemon. The greatest curse for the ancient Egyptians was to be removed, deleted from existence. Now I know what you're going to say now I mentioned curses. The curse of Tutankhamun. Many people believe that, don't they? Many people believe there was a curse on the tomb and many of us died. I think it's nonsense. Yes, Lord Carnarvon did die two months after we opened that tomb. But that was of an infection. Some others died as well, not long after, of, of misadventure or illnesses. But we found over 5,800 objects in that tomb. And there were 58 of us going in and out every day. And only a handful have actually passed. So no, I don't believe in the curse. Although, I do remember something strange in 1926. I noted it down in my diary. We were examining some of the more personal items that were left in the tomb. And I saw a troop of jackals standing on a rock just watching. Jackals, of course, are the pets of Anubis, the guardian of the dead. I have been working in Egypt for 30 years by that point. And I'd never seen any jackals anywhere near a tomb before. And I never did again. Thank you very much for listening. My name's Howard Carter. Take care of each other. And stay safe.